Thank you very much. It's a privilege for me to be here, and quite a surprise, as a matter of fact, to find out what you do. So I'm going to ask some questions. Well, let me tell you. There are two rules before we get. I say this for everybody. Kids, you're kids. OK, we're all kids. I'm the oldest kid here. I'm 72. I saw you raise your eyebrows. Uh, we, are, we are all as, as young as we feel. So I'm, I'm a very young 72. Uh, the two rules that I find really work Ask questions anytime you want to. I've got some slides, but we don't have to use any. I mean, we don't have to go past this first one. Um, and the second most important rule is there are no dumb questions. If there is something that, that you want to ask, please, please, please ask it. So uh, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about, and that's my purpose for being here. Just so you know, this title down there, uh, the, the US State Department has a program that's been around for, what, six years? Um, started in the Obama administration, I forgot how long, but where they select four to five people, six maybe, each year to serve one year as science envoys. And I'm really lucky because I'm neither a scientist nor an engineer. Uh, I'm just a plain old pilot. And, um, but because they had never had a, a space envoy, uh, then I was invited to join the team this year and become a, a science envoy for space. So my job, if you want to say that, it's really fun, is to come out and talk a little bit about um, you know, what type of science and engineering and technology, mathematics advances or developments going on in the US, but more importantly, what role can we play in the US to facilitate the success of people in other parts of the world who may be more advanced than we are in some areas and may be trying to get to where we are in other areas. And so I happen to believe I, I was the healthy skeptic when I became the NASA administrator. When President Obama uh, nominated me to be the NASA administrator back in 2009, I came in um, sort of really skeptical about this commercial space stuff. Um, you know, I was a, I was a dyed-in-the-wool NASA person. Uh, I, had, I, I spent 34 years in the Marine Corps as an active-duty Marine Corps officer, uh, flying most of the time. And then I had been 14 years in Houston, Texas in the, in the astronaut office. So everything I knew was government. And it was done by the government. And I just, you know, that was my mindset. And, and thinking that we were going to be able to turn over some of the responsibilities, particularly for space flight and space operations, to the private sector, it, it was not in the realm of impossible, but I was guardedly optimistic. And, and it turns out for very good reasons. Nothing happens quickly anywhere. Um, frequently, and we talked about this earlier today when I was talking to some of the youth council members, frequently people will cite policy that really is not applicable, but it's a reason for them to stay in the past. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do as I travel around the world is talk about some of the lessons that we learned in this journey of discovery where we were holding on to old ways of doing business when there were new things that we could do that would help us to get where we wanted to go a lot faster. Where do I want to go? I want to go to Mars. So I will, I will say that out, out, out front. Mars is all in the United States. I'm not sure about over here. Uh, Mars was kind of a, when I first became the NASA administrator, it was not a good topic. It was a verboten topic. I think the only two people in the Obama administration who believed in Mars were the president and me. And, and the good thing was, I was on the right side. Because I didn't care what everybody else wanted to do. I knew that the president was really excited about at least starting humans on a real no stuff journey to Mars. You know, with a defined goal of getting humans there in a certain set period of time. He recognized fully that it was not going to happen in any term that he served because you just can't do it that quickly. But he really wanted to facilitate the effort to get there. The other thing he recognized quite well was we can't do it alone. And so my, my other direction was go out and try to find a way to bring into the family of spacefaring nation as many non-traditional partners as you can. And so that was the, the purpose of some of you all are too young. But, but my first trip here 
uh, outside of the military was actually in 2010, 2011, when I came over to visit to talk about what I thought or what we thought uh, could be done in the region, particularly with the UAE that seemed to be a, a country that was really focused on the future and, and we saw a lot of hope here. And, and that you can see the things, I can see things that have happened over the last six years that I would not have believed if you had asked me six years ago, would you be where you are today? So, so let me use that as a sort of a background for why I'm here this time and, and what we want to do. Like I said, please ask questions as we go along. Take a look at the map behind me, the chart behind me in the, in the slide. What do you notice? Um, what's, what's kind of, it, I won't say unique, but you all are smart people, so, so you'll notice it. It's sort of a nighttime view of the planet, and it's the only time that, uh, that you get any clue that there are differences on the planet, that there may be uh, different countries or there may be other kinds of things. I'm gonna show you another uh, picture of the region that is one slide that I, I took. It, it's, in a, it's actually in, a, in, a, uh, in an IMAX film set of fil film footage and I took one slide of the Middle East region to demonstrate what I say when I, when I tell you there are no borders on Earth. There are no boundaries. So uh, you, un unless you, you are old enough to have been taught that there are differences in people and cultures and all this kind of stuff. Uh, if you were Martian coming to Earth and you got to the altitude where we were when we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope, which was about 600 kilometers, uh, you turn around and go back because you would say this planet is not inhabited. Uh, there's no evidence that there's anybody down there because in the daytime, which happens every 45 minutes going around Earth in low Earth orbit, you see no signs of cities. Um, big cities sometimes show up as, as kind of gray blobs, but that's about it. That's the only thing you get. Long linear features, roads, bridges, runways, those kinds of things you can see with the human eye, but, but you don't see buildings and you don't, you see no evidence of people um, except at night. And uh, anybody notice, anybody want to tell me why you notice that there may be borders and boundaries? What's the first indication? The northern border of India there, like sharp. Go, go. Who else? Think about, what do, you, what do you all do? So like this first row, are you all together? Since you're all, you're not. You know each other? No, no. Oh, <laughs> what do you do? I'm a aircraft engineer. What do you do? I'm an engineer. Also. For which company? Emirates Okay. At Dubai, I can say I'm you work on the airplanes, or you design them, or you build them? I uh, do the maintenance for them. Okay. Um, I'm a smart grid, smart energy. Okay. Nuclear, Emirates nuclear energy. Ah, we need for you to think about space transportation. <laughs> Got to go faster. Okay, we need nuclear energy to go faster. Or plasma, or something like that. How about you? Nuclear as well. Nuclear. Uh, doctorate student. Doctorate student in what? Management. I work on the museum in the future. Ah, I want to come back and see it. <laughs> and I don't want to wait until 2020, 2021. <laughs> no. I mean, I know, I want to, you know, see how it's going. What do you do? Econo Econ are you an economic advisor or uh, for, the, for, the, for the government? North Korea. Oh. Government. Which, which government? government? Libya. Libya. Ah, okay. Art history. Uh, art history. A teacher or an artist or all of the above? Yeah. Here? No. Where? Retired. You live here? Yes. Okay. You live here? Yes. Okay. So does everybody live here? So you all didn't just come in off the street. You, you saw that there was a gathering or something. So everybody has a purpose. How about you? Uh, at Tech Startup. Okay. Tech Startup. Okay. Um, because I spend my time traveling the world even before I became an astronaut, and because I work with a lot of people in my 34 years in the Marine Corps, and I, my business was engagement, which means my business was to, to try to reach out to people, some people that were not very friendly, not very good sometimes, and try to just give them an example to see of what could be done, you know, if you, if you thought about it and you agreed to work with people. So I, I look at things sometimes a little bit differently. And, and like I said, people ask where you changed. Um, they usually mean religiously. They ask you, were you changed when you went to space? And I have to disappoint them and say, no. Uh, my perspective on the planet changed. And it's things like this. 
what you're looking at is the difference between haves and have-nots, rich and poor. So there, I mean, the United, you can't find, well, there are little spots. I mean, this is where the bulk of the wealth in the world is. And you can see it because there's light. You know, they've actually got electrical energy and stuff like that. You come down here into Central, into South America, and particularly the African pop, uh, continent, not, that does not mean it's not populated or it doesn't have people. It just means they don't have very much wealth that's spent on the continent. They've got a lot of material wealth, but, but it's spent other places. It goes away. But anyway, that's, that's the point there. Um, so this is the one that, that I want you to look at. So now you, you know that region, and you probably know it very well, um, because kids, every time I said, OK, where is that? And they said, it's the world. And I said, no, but specifically, where? oh, it's Egypt. So everybody jumps on the Nile River and the Nile River Delta, the Sinai Peninsula, and Jordan and Israel up here, the, Gulf, the um, Mediterranean Sea that you can't see very well because it's kind of covered, Western Saudi Arabia. And I actually, if I had waited a few more seconds, this image, instead of having most, most of Egypt, Egypt would have been gone by then, and you'd be looking at the UAE and Oman and that particular region. So that's, you're traveling five miles a second over Earth. You go around Earth once every 90 minutes, so you see daylight for 45 minutes, darkness for 45 minutes. Daylight, darkness, and it just goes back and forth. 16 times every normal Earth day, you see the most beautiful thing that you can imagine sunrise and sunset. And, uh, and sunrise is like an explosion. This little ball goes poof, pops up behind Earth and, and it's brilliant. And then, you know, 45 minutes later, you look over behind you and, and it's like somebody blowing on a candle and blowing out the candle and it gets really dark. So daylight, you don't see any stars because the sun is way too bright for our eyes and we just cannot discern stars in the, in the daylight. Yeah, when, it, when it turns dark, that's all you see is stars. And then some of the lights down on Earth. So you frequently when you're in, in um, relatively uninhabited areas, you can sometimes get confused as to what's the ground and, and what's the sky because there are more lights in the sky than there are on the ground. But that's, that's my, my image of the planet uh, from a 600 kilometer view by a Martian who decides when they get to this altitude that they've picked the wrong planet, there's nobody there, and they're turning around and they're going somewhere else. So that's why I think I look at it from the Martian perspective. Let me tell you a little bit, of, and please ask questions, okay, because I have no idea what it is you want to know or you want to hear or you want to challenge me on unless you ask, unless you just came in here to get a break. Uh, from the heat or something like that. Let me talk a little bit, very little bit, about who NASA is and what they do. Um, it is the space agency in the United States, but it's much more than that. NASA was founded in 1958 after the Soviets launched Sputnik into space. NASA comes from an organization called the NACA that was the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, which came into being more than 100 years ago when after the U.S. invented the airplane, they poo-pooed it. They just said the Wright brothers couldn't get anybody to buy an airplane except the Europeans. The Europeans took the airplane, refined it, began to market it, began to sell it, and the U.S. looked up and said, wait a minute, that's ours. Why are we not doing some of that? And so this organization called NACA was founded to try to get the U.S. back into the aeronautics game, and from that, came supersonic flight, uh, a lot of other things, and eventually we just took, when President Dwight Eisenhower after Sputnik said, we've got to get into the space game. Uh, then he established NASA. It replaced NACA in, in, as the title, but it, subs it subsumed what NACA was doing, which was aeronautics. And today, NASA's engaged in trying to develop X-planes again. So we've got a a uh, high-speed supersonic, quiet supersonic airplane uh, that is called Quest. Uh, Lockheed Martin, for example, has a contract right now with NASA. There are a number of civilian airline com airplane companies that are looking at similar designs, and the purpose is to have it such that it goes supersonic 
and you don't get a sonic boom. You don't get the boom that breaks windows and stuff. But because of the shape of the airfoil, you get a little sort of a burble and a murmur. And it's able to meet noise standards so that we can fly it in supersonic flight over ground, which we, we today in the US cannot do. This one is called Maxwell. It's an, it's an all electric airplane. It's, this version of it has 14 electric propellers uh, on the wing. There's a company called Scale Composite. Some of you may have heard about it. Used to be owned by the, it was founded by the Rutan brothers, Bert and Rutan, and, and they, um, they now took a normal commercial airplane or a civilian airplane, converted it, put a new wing on it, and did some other stuff for NASA. So this is a NASA Scale Composites collaboration on an X-plane that's looking at hybrid or ele all, all electric airplanes. Um, the other part of NASA is science, big part. The two big areas in NASA are human space flight, which everybody knows, uh, mainly the International Space Station today, and then science. And science is divided into four categories, heliophysics, earth science, planetary science, astrophysics. And some of the stuff that goes on today, right now the Parker Solar Probe is speeding its way to, to, sun, to the sun, where it's going to get closer to the sun than we have ever done before learn a lot more about it than we've ever known before and eventually drop a probe into the sun and as long as we can track it, as long as it survives, we'll get as much data as we can about temperature, uh, plasma, electronic, electromagnetic effects and everything else, trying to help us understand things like solar winds uh, and, and those kinds of uh, phenomena. Um, earth science, this is an area that should be pretty important to, to those of you who live here in the Emirates. Uh, NASA and our partner nations have just an abundance of Earth science satellites orbiting the planet today, looking at, uh, at, at our planet, trying to understand uh, things that are causing climate change, uh, things that, whether it's oceans or land or atmosphere, um, and you are about to launch a satellite next Monday called Halifasat, which will join this constellation of Earth monitoring satellites. It'll be somewhat different because it will be in a near polar orbit. It's gonna be launched out of Kanagashima in Japan on a Japanese launch vehicle. And it will begin to give us data that will complement uh, what we get right now from 30 or 40 years of archived Earth Science Data Plus real-time data that's coming down from NASA, ESA, J Japanese, and other space agency satellites. So uh, Halifa Sat is something that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, I've, I was pleased to find that most of the school kids with whom I've talked over the last day and a half are excited about Halifa Sat, and most of them know about it. Most of them can tell you about it. Not sure how many of you in here can talk to me about Halifa Sat, but uh, you'll get a chance to watch it on Dubai TV on Monday morning, what did they tell us, 9 o'clock launch time or something like that. So, so Eight in the morning. Hmm? Eight, in the morning. Eight in the morning, okay. This is um, when we talk about planetary science. We're looking at, at other planets, not only in our solar system, but in the universe today. So we now know that there are more than 2,000 planets. We classify as what we call exoplanets and they're planets that are orbiting other suns and other galaxies uh, in other constellations of the billions of constellations in the universe. We have a telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope that's now scheduled to launch in 2021, 2022. It's actually gonna peer into the atmosphere of these exoplanets and tell us what the atmosphere is made of to help us understand whether there's even any potential for life there. Why do we study those planets? because they're in what we call the Goldilocks zone. Uh, if you remember the, 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 the fairy tale, Goldilocks and the three bears, you know, the, the baby bear wanted the porridge, not too hot, not too cold. Earth is in the Goldilocks zone of the sun, not too hot, not too cold, so it can sustain life. We're looking at these 2,000 plus planets because they're in roughly the same area around their own star, not too hot, not too cold, not too close to the sun, to the star, and not too far away, and we suspect that maybe they, they sustain life. InSight is a lander that NASA launched, NASA and some of its partner uh, space agencies launched back uh, last spring, will arrive on Mars and land uh, on the 26th of November, 
and it'll be the first lander that has its own ability to take its own robotic arms and put different instruments around it on the Martian surface. It actually has a drill that's going to core down into the Martian surface several meters, bring up a soil sample that it will put into a container and just keep it there until we and our partners come up with a way to, to bring a sample back from Mars. We don't have that capability today, but, but we're working with a lot of our partner nations to find a way to bring a soil sample back from Mars. Questions for us. This is a, seismo a seismograph. So it's actually seismological instruments that are, have little probes that are sticking down in the Martian surface. And they're measuring um, stuff like, like uh, earthquake activity or, or tremors on Mars. Because we think Mars is still a very active planet. And we want to know a little bit more about, about what it's doing. TESS is a, a satellite we launched recently. And TESS is looking to find more of these exoplanets. So it's looking for uh, transiting uh, exoplanets and the, and the like around other stars and, and, uh, and in, in, the, in, in the universe. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. Unlike any telescope you've ever seen, there is no tube. This is the telescope. Uh, this thing is massive. These are people. And look at that compared to the telescope. What's unique about it is we fold it all up. Each of these is about 18 different individual segments and they fold up into a teeny weeny little thing and we put it in the nose cone of a, of a rocket and we launch from uh, Kourou in French Guiana um, hopefully in 2021 and it goes a million and a half kilometers from Earth to what we call a Lagrange point, a point where there's the gravity from the sun, moon, earth are all kind of balanced out and it sits in this Lagrange point and it will begin to study the universe. And I think it's gonna dwarf what we learn from the Hubble Space Telescope. Because Hubble, as good as it is, can't look as far as, as James Webb is gonna be able to look. When people talk about we're gonna look back to the beginning of time, all they're saying is, because it's so sensitive, it's going to detect light that's coming from 13 billion years ago uh, that other instruments can't detect. So we'll have to wait 13 billion light years, or however long it takes for something to travel 13 billion years ago time. I don't know what that is, but it's a long time. So this is why James Webb is so, so important for us. Um, this is the International Space Station. Any of you have kids? Anybody have kids that are 18 years or younger? They have not taken a breath, not one single breath in their lifetime when human beings have not been living and working on the International Space Station. And the interesting thing about the International Space Station, if I go back to talking about what advantage space gives you in bringing people together, the, the partners on the International Space Station come from five different entities. Uh, the, the biggest one is the, is the European Space Agency that consists of about 25 different nations, but the primary partners are the U.S. and Russia. So at any time, even when we've gone down to two crew members from time to time on the International Space Station, there's always been a Russian along with an American on the International Space Station. So in spite of the fact that we seem not to be able to get along down here, we are the perfect partners in space uh, doing business on the International Space Station. This we'll have to replace in time. It's lifetime, uh, we think maybe 2024, 2028 at the outset from an engineering perspective, since you're, uh, you, know, you work on airplanes and stuff, just, just figure this is a big airplane. So what airplanes you do, like uh, Boeing and Airbus? Airbus and 380. Okay, so like you've got an Airbus 380, it's got a what kind of expected lifetime or how many flights? Uh, maximum we have 15 years. Okay, so at the end of 15 years you got to do something, right? Yeah. Okay, 2028, that's the, we think from an engineering perspective, if you were maintain, maintaining this thing, but right now you'd be thinking, okay, I want to keep it longer than 2028, what do I need to do? Well, it's way too expensive, way too complex, so 2028, it's probably going away. In fact, the U.S. government, for its part, would like to see it go away sooner because it's expensive. You know, it's, it's the most technologically advanced thing that, 
I think we've ever put together, but a lot of it is old technology. If you look at the solar arrays, these are new solar arrays, but even they are way outdated. So, you know, they don't have the efficiency that you want. What we envision when I talked about commercial engagement, commercial involvement, is that in time, there will be other entities, some of them commercial, not, not national space agencies, that will produce platforms like this, like a module that goes out and stands alone in some Earth orbit where we can do things like materials processing or pharmaceuticals development. Astronauts go up, we call it human tended. They go up, spend enough time to set up an experiment, and then they come back home. And then they go back to pick up whatever the product was made there. And I think that's where we're going uh, as the space station gets phased out. Some of the things that go on on station, we do a lot of medical experimentation. Uh, up there you saw, it went, there you go. People ask, how does, a, how does an astronaut maintain their, their form, fit, and function? How do they stay in shape? Well, it's because we have a variety of exercise apparatus today. Every astronaut is required to work out every day, not, not some days, every day. They're given two hours, and you know, most of them work for about an hour. And uh, one of the favorite pieces of apparatus that's the most effective is called the ARAD. It's a resistive device that's like a universal gym down here on Earth. And what we found that is if you want to stop or slow bone loss, you need stress and strain like we have down here on Earth, walking around and doing that kind of stuff. If you want to stop or slow muscle atrophy, you need to do exercises. And so that's what we do. So diet is one way, exercise is the primary way, and if it's absolutely necessary, we can actually give medicinal supplements like vitamin D, calcium, you name it. And we look at every astronaut's caloric intake every day, nutritionists, flight surgeons, uh, dietitians go over the data that comes down from every astronaut and give them information, okay, you need to do this, you need, you need to add this exercise, or you need to adjust this exercise, or you need to add this supplement or you need to go get some iron in your diet or something like that. So that's the way we monitor it. This was the first time, this was Scott Kelly with his uh, Russian counterpart, Mikhail Kornienko. They stayed on the International Space Station for one whole year. So it was the, the one year experiment. But Scott and, and his U.S. cohorts are actually eating the first crop of lettuce grown on the International Space Station. In preparation for going to Mars, we've either got to take a lot of food or you gotta make it. So we're, we're finding out how you grow your own food. Um, we were talking on the way over here, you all are doing some things with uh, producing, uh, what is it, brick from, I forgot, but it's not normal way of doing brick. And 3D printing, you're 3D printing buildings. Well, we're looking at that kind of stuff for space travel. 3D printing components of, of rockets, 3D printing. We do it today. SpaceX, for example, a, a large number of components of a SpaceX Merlin rocket engine are 3D printed. So that's kind of the wave of the future. So that's what we're doing there. Um, these are the vehicles that we use today, uh, cargo vehicles. This is the Russian Soyuz that carries the crew. We're hoping to supplement that with the SpaceX Crew Dragon. Um, and let me go show you two more. This is one that we in the U.S. don't use right now. Today it is only the, the second available uh, spacecraft that can carry humans to space. It's the, the Chinese Shenzhou. And for law, law purposes in the U.S., NASA is not allowed to collaborate with the Chinese in human spaceflight. A mistake, I think, on our part, but who knows? We'll, time will tell. This is the Boeing CST-100. That's the SpaceX drag, Crew Dragon, and that's where we're going. Uh, I don't know how many of you have an interest in becoming astronauts, but there are two UAE astronaut candidates right now who are in training in, in Russia. Um, one of these days, there may be a contingent of UAE astronauts that's, that's this big. That's, that, that's, sev that's the 12 people that we selected in the 2017 class, selected from 18,300 applicants. So uh, it, it's pretty competitive. Oh, that's uh, tough, tough club to join, but uh, who knows, it can be done. Uh, technology is the driver. Yeah, I think all of you in here know that. Uh, these are CubeSats. We actually have an elementary school today in the United States, at, in Arlington, Virginia, that built a CubeSat. 
and it got sent to the International Space Station and deployed. So we actually have had an elementary school fly a satellite in the U.S. and there's no reason it can't be done here. Um, again, looking at habitation systems, uh, ways to refuel in space robotically so that humans don't have to be exposed to the, the risk there, but also so that you can take spacecraft and reuse them on orbit because you can refuel them, refurbish them, do other things robotically, some of the things we're doing. Um, I think I'm going to show you a video that's going to help us to, to close out here. This is the concept today in, in, based on something called the Global Exploration Roadmap. It's a, it's a plan for exploration development that gets us to the moon in the 2030s uh, developed collaboratively among about 25 different nations. The UAE was, particip was a participant in that, not a signatory, but, but actually a participant, sitting at the table when the plan came up where we're gonna migrate away from low Earth orbit with government organizations and leave that to the civilian sector, private sector. Migrate to lunar uh, operations for the decade of the 20s, uh, hopefully actually putting humans back on the surface of the moon and then eventually in the decade of the 30s moving on to Mars with humans. So that's sort of the plan. A lot of people say, yeah, but that's all drawing board stuff. Not so. We're actually building hardware, testing hardware, flying tests. We've actually, Orion is the crew module that we're going to use to carry humans back to the moon and on to Mars. And we actually flew Orion on a test flight back in December of 2014. So four years ago, we actually flew Orion on a test flight where it went higher than any spacecraft intended to carry humans had been in, in, uh, since we last went to the moon. So that'll give you an idea of, of where we are. And so if this works, um, where I'm going, let's see if I can get there. No, so <laughs> You can turn it up a little bit if you want. Well, I, I have the control now. Let me know if it hurts your ears and I'll turn it down. I reset it. Okay. That's the nose cone that goes on the, the space launch system, the heavy lift launch vehicle. This is an artist's concept of launching from the Kennedy Space Center. So you can see it. It looks somewhat like the old Saturn V, but it's much bigger than a Saturn V by several hundred feet and much more powerful. Uh, these are old space shuttle main engines that have been converted with new controllers and everything. There are four of them that go on the SLS to carry people to Mars and Moon. These are people at the Kennedy Space Center actually assembling the Orion crew module uh, and getting it ready for its flight in uh, its initial flight in 2019-2020. This is regular re-entry. You're going to see that image is actually that's footage from the December 2014 flight and it's a camera mounted inside Orion with a pilot's eye view looking out the window of what it would look like when your vehicle's burning up around you to keep you from burning up. It's got an ablative uh, covering that burns off and protects the vehicle from overheating and the like. So that's what we're doing today. That's not, that's not drawings and stuff like that. I, I'm gonna close out with, with this image because how many of you actually saw the movie Hidden Figures? Incredible. If you have not seen it, I suggest you go see it. Uh, it is not a story about black women. It is a story about humanity and overcoming adversity and odds and stuff. And I'm, as I met with some of the, the young ladies who are a part of the the uh, Emirates Mars mission team this morning where 90% of the team is female. Uh, that is unheard of. Uh, you would not find that in the United States. But it's a story of young women here in, in UAE who sort of like Katherine Johnson and her cohorts back in the days of before we even sent anybody to space 
came together against all odds to actually practice their trade of mathematics and engineering that they weren't allowed to practice anywhere else, but NASA gave them an opportunity where they became human computers. So uh, if you have friends who have not seen it, it's a phenomenal movie that has lessons for all of us in overcoming adversity. So it's, it's, my, it's my favorite all-time movie. Uh, second only, it, it, it's, it, the second to it is only The Martian. So anyway, <laughs> that's our planet from a, a million and a half kilometers away. Uh, with a satellite now flying called Discovery. The odd looking thing you're seeing going through the, through the image now and then, that's our moon. And you're having an opportunity to see a part of our moon that we don't ever see from Earth. It's the backside of the moon uh, because the moon rotates on its axis at the same rate that it goes around Earth. So every 28 days the, the moon rotates and so we never get to see the back side of the moon unless you get in a spacecraft and go there. And hopefully some of you will get an opportunity to get in a spacecraft and go there one of these days. 